So after the introduction on the subject of shear bonding from the previous lecture, in this lecture 14, we'll start to discuss about factors that influences the degree of shear bonding in, uh, during startup shear. We would particularly focus on under what conditions shear bending would be uh, difficult to observe. Subsequently, I, I would like to discuss the concept of shear bending being a result of uh, disentanglement, like a horse race. And lastly, I'll show you example of shear bending in laws, so-called large amplitude oscillatory shear. All right, uh, any questions? So last time we were trying to finish uh, the beginning introduction of uh, uh, the, the, the attempt to uh, examine whether a simple shear uh, could indeed produce, uh, could indeed be uh, implemented in this way that it is homogeneous. And not being able to do so would be very inconvenient, if not disastrous, because because uh, um, because you only have control of what is H, what is V. So uh, in a, in a typical commercial rheometer, rheometer, you may spend 100,000 K to buy a rheometer, uh, and you. Uh, basically uh, count on this being true. Uh, and as I showed you, uh, there are cases maybe this may not be true, and therefore you need to spend just a few hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, uh, to determine whether your hundred thousand dollar machine is performing as expected. Not because the rheometer is not performing, but because your material may not obey this simple assumption, right? So that's the, that's the, uh, that's where we were last time. So this is just at the beginning of, uh, of, the, of this chapter uh, nine. I start to uh, motivate you about what could happen. So it turns out indeed you can build a, a variety of setups and today we will talk about uh, why this setup is all necessary. So for example, this is a setup uh, of cone plate, quite simply, uh, from the book on chapter uh, four that I omitted. And now we can bring it back. And this would be a scenario if you just have a simple uh, parallel plate. And uh, as I indicated last time already, uh, in, in, uh, in a common plate case, you need to wrap a film, otherwise you cannot see inside. And that wrapping of the film also is preventing edge fracture. Okay. Um, in general, uh, you really have a problem of the edge start to misbehave. And uh, I indicated once before that the way to, uh, to make sure that this misbehaving does not influence your measurement is by the so-called CPP, cone partition plate uh, con uh, configuration. And this configuration, you can also do particle tracking, shine laser through and watch it with a camera, just like, like down here. Uh, lastly, I will indicate uh, another setup where indeed the camera is coming uh, into watching every layer. So indeed, this is the case you need confocal. You don't see all the layer at the same time. You only see one Y value at one time. And, uh, 
this is necessary if the gap is only 50 micron. But there is no way for 50 micron for this scenario to work. Uh, too small, anyway. Uh, because we are now using a big uh, magnification here. Uh, so the, uh, the reason to use such small gap this is, I'm basically uh, drawing a, a uh, drawing a uh, rotating sh a cone plate or sh a parallel plate, and uh, uh, the gap is, the, the meniscus is here, and uh, uh, This smaller gap allow you to claim a much bigger aspect ratio. H is now one, right? So R is still about two centimeters, but H now is only 50 microns. So this aspect ratio will severely uh, remove any of the edge effect uh, from, from, uh, from playing an important role when you are away, away far away from the edge. So these are the few uh, setups uh, uh, I'm indicating, but mainly I will motivate for you why we need such setups. Uh, so uh, one of the last thing I would say technically is usually you have a objective lens of two to three X is enough. This essentially allow us to have on your monitor about covering about two millimeter will fill up your, your monitor screen, two or three, more or less uh, on that order of magnitude. So this means uh, uh, your gap of one will, will be all inside. So this is your height you will be able to watch the whole view as you saw in those movie, as you saw in, in this movie, for example. So this is uh, about a millimeter. This is about two millimeter. And uh, it is just, uh, if you look at this point, it, if I borrow this top on, it's just one point, gee, right? It's just one point you're looking at about uh, about two millimeters. But you assume that's the same everywhere else, right? And you assume further, uh, this two millimeter will be the same as this two millimeter if you're a little closer. If it's cone plate, of course, the gap will drop by the shear rate the, the, the parent shear rate will be the same, V over H will be the same. So basically that's the notion. Uh, you are dealing with something on the scale of a millimeter uh, that you are watching. Uh, so to begin with, uh, as I indicated, the reason we studied, start to look at the, the assumption of, of this homogeneous deformation was because we were uh, motivated to look at the so-called uh, uh, well, so-called entanglement, disentanglement transition, and we're interested in finding out whether there was wall slip. And in a rheometer like this, the only way to study shear is to use solution because, uh, because this edge effect will be much less severe if it's a solution. And also because the torque available for you is actually never enough for you to deal with melt. So we use the solution to bring the plateau modulus down by a factor of phi 2.3. So when phi is 
you are reducing this by more than two order magnitude. So the material is sufficiently soft. It turns out this edge effect, this edge, so what happens? I'm trying to save, auto save. This edge effect, edge fracture, is uh, known to be related to so-called second normal stress which, of course, also grows with uh, the plateau modulus. So that's why you, you want to uh, uh, make it small enough so the edge is not a problem. Edge fracture is not a problem. So, uh, so in the initial try, we're tr trying to look for uh, entanglement, uh, look for stick-slip transition. We didn't find it. We found entanglement, disentanglement transition instead. From there, we had the suspicion that we should examine this homogeneous shear to see if, uh, at least in controlled stress mode, it will be homogeneous. And all this uh, means we have to prepare a bunch of uh, samples. So these, uh, these are the tables listing uh, samples, mainly in the 5 to 10 percent or 15 percent concentration range with molecular weight very high so that you have enough entanglement, even at 10 percent. Okay. So this is a great deal of uh, effort and, and a great deal of uh, samples to deal with. And uh, lastly, we, we even have uh, two more samples that's mentioned in chapter six, uh, where the concentration is uh, stay fixed, but we change the amount of, uh, we change the uh, solvent in terms of molecular weight of the solvent. This is all polybutadiene. So instead of a, a millimolecular weight of polybutadiene, we have 1.5K versus 10K of polybutadiene as the solvent. And there are parameters that you can see that because the maximum slip length inversely depend on the solvent viscosity, one could reduce B by a great deal by using a very viscous solvent. So these are the parameters you can see. They are changing by more than a factor of 10. Uh, so this is uh, 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 just uh, uh, some information. Uh, what I want to uh, go through very quickly is how come we observed uh, wall slip. Uh, sorry, we observed uh, shear banding. This has to do with uh, beginning with uh, right in, in chapter nine, uh, the first one is about shear banding in over in startup, and uh, uh, I, I indicated a little bit of uh, uh, history last time, so we're not going to go through it. And then the second part was, what are the controlling factors? So I called it relevant factors. In other words, what it takes for you to be able to see that there is a slip. So, uh, so this, is, this is just keep breaking down. So you can see the first thing that's required is to have high entanglement. In other words, uh, what does that mean? Well, we'll talk about it later, but basically it means high degree of entanglement. Basically, it means your B, the uh, slip length. This is where I will soon demonstrate to you the connection between wall slip and what we are discussing in the bulk. Right? This uh, shear bending, of course, is something in the bulk. But how come on Earth you are speaking about slip length, which is, uh, which is of course, what? Uh, uh, what was defined at the interface. So it turns out, we'll find out that very soon. So it turns out for you to have, to see wall slip, you don't want this B to be too small. You want this B perhaps comparable to H. Okay. Um, and we will make an argument very soon. And to uh, that's one. And number two, uh, you 
want to control uh, sleep or sleep. Well, you want to control wall sleep. Basically, you did homework. You want, your, you want to be able to apply WI higher than that critical WI wall sleep to bulk nonlinear, which is about 1 plus 2 B max over H. And you see that that's not very difficult to achieve if this is the condition, right? Uh, you did the homework. In fact, the homework, what you did is, what you should appreciate is, uh, I give you an example of polystyrene versus polyethylene. Uh, you will see that for polystyrene, it's very easy to avoid wall slip, whereas for polyethylene, it was difficult, uh, meaning you have to imply, apply sufficiently large WI. Uh, and uh, uh, the thirdly, I just need to want to be complete about this. Thirdly, you, you need to avoid edge effect. And uh, the way one uh, avoids it, uh, uh, I already mentioned that you need to uh, edge instability. Generally, by having 10% solution, you could, you could largely remove that effect, reduce that effect. Okay, uh, more importantly, is this one I, I want to say, is that it's shear bending can be argued uh, to be absent when B max over H is much smaller than one. So this goes back to the condition of this being the condition for shear value. If that's not true, if this is much smaller than H, it will not have shear value. So I want to spend a, a significant amount of time on explaining this part. In other words, not only we initially observed shear bending, subsequently we start to uh, develop why or, or what's the condition, why we were able to see was uh, shear bending and, and, uh, and what, what is the uh, material that require, that, that satisfies such condition. Uh, so there I have a lovely uh, plot in the, in the book, but I didn't open the book, so I can just do it uh, by drawing. It's, it's equally simple. So I'm drawing basically figure uh, 9.2. Uh, let's, uh, say, let's say we were able to control such that there is very little wall slip. In fact, if this is the condition, you know there is no, there is no wall slip, right? So this, you see how connected it is. Whatever we are talking about, build on our uh, discussion of wall slip, if this is the condition, you should go back and recall, then the wall slip is, uh, is uh, 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 not noticeable, it's not even measurable, because that ratio characterizes how much wall slip can uh, correct for the bulk shear field. So if that's uh, much less than one, there is no wall slip. Then, uh, if you like, this, of course, is your V, and this is H. And, of course, you have been applying a shear rate of V over H as the apparent shear rate. Let's, and it's, suppo it's supposed to go there, but let's suppose there is slip in the following sense. There is, I still use VS, but there is internal slip. In other words, if we know that slip occurs as a result of disentanglement at the interface, uh, let's say there is disentanglement also in the bulk, in the in, in, in inside the sample. Okay. 
at some point as you start to hear. Then obviously, such an event is uh, unimportant. It will not result in anything if this is much smaller than one, right? Do, 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 uh, this is the uh, trivial argument I'm making, right? If Vs is much smaller than V, then, which is of course not what I draw, then, God, let me do it. Uh, then your, what I'm representing is just one point here, right? Because it's much smaller than. The limit of this will be just a, a point here so that this velocity field is not changed at all, right? In that limit. So this limit, there will be no change in the strength field, in the shear field. And I can argue, uh, keep in mind, let's assume this is produced by one layer of disentanglement. If it produces no consequence, then the other layer could also disentangle or yield or do whatever, and you will have no uh, you will have, uh, uh, so here is, of course, the, 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 the more uh, detailed uh, story. You have a million layers of polymers. I'm not drawing the coils. I'm just drawing the chains for you. Uh, I'm just drawing the layers for you. There are million layers of it. And as you start to shear, do a startup shear, V all of a sudden started. As you start to shear, all the layers are being sh elastically sheared. At one point, if there is a condition for yield, we already talked about yield before, which uh, is a microscopic concept. My stress no longer build. We have not said very much about the molecular origin of why there is yield. But we have loosely said perhaps it's because structure break apart and the structure being entanglement. So perhaps some entanglement start to disentangle. And that could happen perhaps for one of the layers. One monolayer start to disentangle. Because every, you have a million layers, one of the one million layers will do it first, by definition. It's a horse race. I think this concept of being a horse race is accurate. It's a horse race. When you subject this sample to shear, uh, the system is trying to uh, uh, deal with this deformation until it gives in, for reasons we have not yet been able to talk about. But let's say there is one layer start to give in, give in in the sense of disentanglement. Then we know, based on the argument in war slip part, that if one layer disentangles, it will produce certain uh, uh, slip velocity determined by the stress. And therefore, uh, we can uh, ask how much slip there is by taking a ratio of the slip velocity over the overall velocity. So if this ratio is much smaller than one, then this event does not change the shear field, by definition. Then the next layer can disentangle. Then the next layer can disentangle. And so this is the argument that if one layer of disentanglement does not correct the homogeneity condition, then the next layer can disentangle with the same condition. And the horse race will, there will be no horse race in the sense all the horses will eventually all disentangle. So that's the argument, very obvious one, very obvious one, OK? Because you've got a million layers, one layer disentangle will produce a Vs. And if they produce a Vs, 
that's not small compared to V, then there will be the question whether the other layers, well, you know the question here already. For example, come on. For example, you, if this, what I draw, if what I draw is true, okay, which obviously is a Vs over V that's finite, yeah? It's measurable, it, it's appreciable. Look what happens the, to the blue. This part of the sample will be shared at a lower rate. Yeah, by definition, because the, the, the V over H rate is this blue black line. A blue, rather green actually, which I know is green. Uh, and compared to that, it will be slow. It will be of lower rate. And this lower rate would make sure all these layers avoid disentanglement. So the word I use is, is victimizing. Right? This whole story is about victimizing. It's about some part of the layer become the victim. They will take care of the fact it's being shared very much, and so that other part will be shared less. So that's the argument, okay? Um, I, uh, if this is unfamiliar, it's okay. It just, uh, um, uh, it, meaning, it's, to me, it's pretty straightforward that, that uh, uh, the logic here is pretty straightforward. And uh, I assume uh, uh, the, the book also describes this logic, uh, but I, I, I think we can uh, live with this concept. And uh, so then the whole story is about figuring out what do you mean to have this condition? Because I said, well, sorry. Uh, let, let, me, let me read this English for you again. This section basically says, shear bonding would, would be absent. Perhaps it's a better way to warn you what I mean. Would be absent if this is true. I will prove this statement in the following. That's what I'm going to try to prove. And the way to prove it is what I did as follows. I suggest that shear bonding is absent if this is true. Okay? And I will show you that this condition is guaranteed by this condition, and then the logic is tight. So this condition will guarantee this is true, and I just argued if this is true, then there cannot be shear bending. B over H is the condition that will give you Vs over V being much smaller. If B over H is much smaller, then Vs over V will be much smaller, and that will be clear in the next uh, page. Right. So let's just work out what it is. So Vs, by definition, is uh, sigma over beta. So I'm going to add a h um, upstairs and downstairs. I'm going to multiply a tau upstairs and downstairs, and I'm going to uh, uh, indicate the bottom is, of course, just the Weisenberg number, apparent Weisenberg number. On the top, I have H. I'm going to claim B0 is the rest of the quantity, and B0 is beta, is sigma divided by beta, times tau. So if you recall, we're doing a startup, so the stress changes with strain, and you may even have an overshoot, and I indicate to you uh, shear bending. We experimentally observe them just after the, the overshoot. 
And I further indicate to you that uh, the maximum, according to this expression, the maximum B you can have is when stress is maximum. Stress maximum is right here. We call sigma Y. Sigma Y is more or less the same as sigma gamma Y over a plateau modulus. So this is the expression that uh, uh, I have it early on for you. So this is all described in equation 7.4a and 4b. I didn't go through it in the class because it's just something, uh, oh gosh, it's just something uh, Uh, according to observations. So the stress is sort of linear in the strand. And the reason I want to do that is I want to bring this back to here. So I will say that this, I will continue to write, write ex, this expression. I will say the stress is essentially is going to be on the level of G plateau modulus gamma Y beta tau. And you recognize that in, from Maxwell model that plateau modulus times tau is essentially the viscosity. Okay? So this basically says it's viscosity divided by beta multiplied by gamma y. Okay? So, uh, you recognize what this is. This, uh, let, me, let me try to, uh, I just want to be consistent with my, my uh, uh, notation in the book. So allow me to just call this B. And I will call this B0. OK? If uh, I don't, uh, a wall slip, it's just uh, chapter 6, not long ago. The viscosity divided by beta is the formula for wall slip, uh, slip length. OK? And keep in mind, the maximum slip length is when beta is minimum. This is what we talked about when it has full disentanglement. So typically, uh, I can say that this, since gamma y, well, it's now more than a factor of two or so. So I'm just going to choose uh, Try to get to the page. To make sure notation is right. Yeah, it was so. It was written. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's essentially the. Uh, the book has a little more. Uh, uh, more I, I don't need to be entirely identical to the book in the sense uh, I'm just going to give you uh, uh, some scaling. So this is uh, uh, the details you can go to the book is what I mean. So this is on the order of uh, two. It turns out uh, uh, it, it turns out I'm going to ignore the two. So this, this is going to be ignored. Basically, I'm arguing that this is B0 over H W. Uh, uh, max, uh, uh, apparent. And therefore, this, of course, is always smaller than the max of H. Keep in mind, the bottom, I isolated the bottom very conveniently because, of course, we're dealing with a case where the applied rate is larger, uh, par, uh, par, uh, the, the Weizmann number is larger than one limit. So this of course, is further smaller than max over H. 
Therefore, I argue, I'm almost like a mathematical theorem. Therefore, I argue if this is much smaller than one, if this is much smaller than one, I guarantee that this is also much smaller than one. Right? Because this denominator is larger than one. Yeah? Uh, so, so, so there is a very uh, explicit way to argue, or, or to indicate what v over v s over v would be. It's dictated by b over h. It's not dictated by b alone. It's dictated by b over h. Magically, look, I just did magic, right? I added the h, I divided the h, right? So I created what I know which is Weisenberg number on the bottom, and I created the length scale where the B can be compared, which is H. Of course, this quantity is dimensionless. Look, all the math is middle school or below. The physical argument may not be entirely familiar to you, but I try my best. It's a horse race. We're talking about whether one layer of disentanglement would alter the homogeneous deformation field or not. If it doesn't alter, other layers will disentangle too, will yield, or whatever word you want to call it, that produces the yield, that produces this magnus. Question? Clear, I mean? My advice to you is don't get buried in the math. As I said, the math is below middle school level. Sorry. Just listen to the concept, the argument about it. The rest is, yeah. of course, I, 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 I keep criticizing about institutionalized learning, which means whatever written in black and white should go through your own derivation. You should convince yourself. But trust me, this, this turns out to be mathematically simple and easy to show. OK, so this is the case. A bulk feature of whether shear bending occurs or not is argued today to be related to a quantity, a concept that we learned in Warslip. Why? Because Warslip is the place where we first develop the notion of what happens if one monolayer of disentanglement occurs, which allowed you to so-called detached from the surface. In other words, your melt is no longer establishing entanglement with the surface, if you like. Or as you know, it's not establishing uh, uh, entanglement with an absorbed layer. The effect of that is heavily discussed in chapter six and related to, as you know, related to, it's all in here, largely related to having a high viscosity due to entanglement. And this was, when minimum occurs is when you have full disentanglement at that layer, right? So without flipping the page, I'm really talking about the red chains disentangle with the bulk chains, which are the black. And that produces the effect that can be characterized by Vs, but can be further characterized by B. And the maximum occurs if your Vs reaches the uh, limiting uh, case, where the book has very detailed study, although we talked about in some lens as well. OK, so we borrow the insight that, in other words, the wall slip teaches us how to anticipate the effect of one monolayer of disentanglement. And that concept allows us to think about 
what if there is a layer of disentanglement in the bulk? And then we proceeded to, to, to argue in what limit one layer of disentanglement in the bulk will have no consequence. In other words, will not uh, produce uh, a, uh, a beginning of a shear bending condition. OK. Any questions on this? So, uh, so as soon as you observe wall slip, sorry, uh, shear bending, you can start to develop this whole argument, of course. And of course, uh, uh, meanwhile, this argument also guides you to design your system. So this is interacted uh, simultaneously. As soon as we observe there is a wall slip, we know what kind of sample to prepare to suppress wall slip. Sorry, shear bending. As soon as we observe shear bending, we know, for example, you didn't, uh, I didn't bring your attention. For example, this two sample doesn't give you shear bending because B over H is too small. Okay? Conversely, let me try to see which one. This one. Okay. This doesn't give you shear bending because the entanglement, molecular weight, the entanglement level is low. Okay? Because you have, let me look at this particular one, 5%. Entanglement level is low because the molecular weight is low and concentration is low. Should use a different color. This, this sample, let me use a different color, to be honest. This two sample are not, this, this both are no shear bending. This two sample in blue has no shear bending because of what? Well, concentration is high and the molecular weight is high because of the high molecular weight solvent. Remember B is maximum B is velocity divided by slip line, sl uh, but by the solvent viscosity. And solvent viscosity here is that of 15K instead of 1K. So there are multiple ways one can tune the parameter of B to verify that you need certain conditions for a shear bending to take place. And this is a variable when you do solution you can control. When you do melt, uh, when you do melts, I just want to cover the, my ground here. When you do melts, you cannot control because that's just the disentanglement determines what that viscosity will be. And we hardly ever do melts uh, because uh, we don't have the right device to do melts. And uh, of course, later I will show you cases where melts were done. Uh, but the physics should be the same. Okay, so um, so this is just uh, n n nothing to to really. Uh, I mean, it's of course terribly important to understand the origin of it. So what I'm trying to say is, it look like all the data we have looked at, uh, all the system we have looked at, uh, 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 are in agreement with this uh, argument. When this is true, you don't have. Shear bending. Uh, I think there is one more thing I need to say before I move on to other topics. Any questions? Let me try to find where is that place. Small gap. I, uh, I still have uh, uh, skipped uh, quite a few of things, uh, but I want to be, make sure you don't you find the information in the in the book. Let me see where do I. I, I 
I know I skipped uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, possible for me to describe this without showing you some of the um, some of the figures. So, uh, so I I need. You, of course, you have seen the movie a few times by now, but I need you to uh, be with me. With, see, here is that, that argument about this, this is the figure, 9.2, showing a sizable VS. Uh, of course, you, ah, here's one more result. Since I'm on this page, let me just do it here. Uh, one last thing we haven't done is uh, there is another condition when shear bonding disappears, which is nine point, which is nine point one point two point five, and that's the condition when Weizmann number is very large. And that's where I'm not going to do uh, uh, any writing. I'm just going to uh, borrow the book page. So it turns out 9.3 uh, basically, if you look at the, uh, what I uh, did there, uh, basically 9.3 basically says it's going to be B0 over H. Wi, and what I omitted was a gamma y factor. That's in there. Okay, so it turns out if you want to be rigorous, it turns out, where is it? God, yeah, here's 9.3. So there is an extra factor that I didn't care to bother. Uh, I, I wrote it in the, in the notes, but I didn't write it at the end of it. But basically, there is this uh, uh, yield strand. And uh, this argument says uh, when the WI is, is smaller than Z, or 3Z, which means the so-called Rawls Weizmann number smaller than one. We talked about Rawls Weizmann number once before. Uh, I know you may have already forgotten. Basically, it's just shear rate times Rawls Weizmann number. Oh, Rawls relaxation time, and Rawls relaxation time you can roughly regard it as related to the reputation relaxation time by three z, and z is molecular weight, the number of uh, entanglement per chain. So in this limit, uh, basically, a, a gamma y will be one. So this is the relation, will be on the order of one. This is the relationship. And when the condition is wi r is larger than one, then we know gamma y is uh, one third of wi. So this allows you to write this expression. Either way, okay? Either way, look at this far. When the Weizmann number is sufficiently large, you can always satisfy the condition of this being smaller than one. Okay? So that's the basically uh, the argument that if you shear, so at some intermediate shear rate, you see shear bending. If you use a higher, sufficiently high shear rate, you will recover homogeneous shear. And this is indeed possible to observe and has been shown in, uh, in, in, in some of the studies. Um, I'm now looking for uh, one of the interesting case. Uh, Uh, 
I'm just, in fact, essentially following the book still. And uh, um, and uh, using without without making any notes further, using the 1.3 section is is about shear bending in rheometry. So I'm just going to use the the books to to indicate a few. I know this is writing has to be. Or if you could ignore that writing part, basically. Uh, there are a bunch of results in the book. Uh, oh, here's one that you should do. <laughs> this is the so-called, remember, uh, the uh, entanglement, disentanglement transition down in the creep mode. Remember, this was, the, this was almost the motivation for, for this whole program, whole idea of looking at the, the shear bending phenomena is the Disentanglement, entanglement, disentanglement transition. You apply a certain stress. This is a, you, I actually used a DNA as a solution. You apply, apply certain stress, and you find the, in a cone plate, you find the plate rotate faster and faster because, because of the so called disentanglement, disentanglement transition, as if the sample become less viscous. Because remember, you fix this. In some sense, this is always true if you treat this as a, uh, as a way to, to think about viscosity. Uh, you're fixing this. So when this is, in, is increasing, then of course the so-called viscosity is decreasing. And you can blame that as due to disentanglement. I, I, I know we have been rather casual about this word so far. Well, basically, you see that the, you watch the rate, the parent rate, right, V over H. You don't, that's the whole point. What you observe is, is the parent rate. You see your upper plate is moving, fa rotating faster and faster at the same stress. That's why it's B E D T. And that's just the surface velocity. We don't know what's inside going on. And it turns out that when you take a movie of it, you'll find, as this shows, that uh, at different times, uh, you have shear bending. You can see the, the, the velocity uh, is plotted on this uh, horizontal axis. The vertical axis is a gap. And you can see that the velocity, uh, the shear rate, is very small here and very large there. So that's just one result. Uh, and then there are many different results in the book. I'm not going uh, uh, to waste a lot of time here in any details here. And for example, this is a, a kind of notion you should have. This was to look at that movie and an analyze it. For example, it's analyzed at these moments denoted by the vertical line, right? Okay, so it was looked at, the velocity field was analyzed at this point, this point, this point. This. So for example, up to the maximum, you see, it's completely homogeneous, okay? Meaning the velocity field is linear. And then at different times, it breaks apart, and 300 seconds, that's nearly steady state, it remains bended. So there are lots of results of this kind uh, that I'm not going in, into uh, further detail on this. The only thing left, so that's what I reviewed for you. The only thing left is to speak a little bit about what you did in homework, that is uh, from wall slip to shear banding. and how we can observe that. Uh, remember, the condition for that to happen is for your applied rate to be higher than, than uh, the ratio of B max over H. And there are two ways 
to change this number to satisfy that condition. One is for the same system, you can change the gap. So this is the, 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 the thing we, we, uh, we could do. One, see the, if, if this ratio, so we have a, a case where H is one millimeter. In another case, H is only 50 microns. That differ by 20 times. Okay, so this side could change by 20 times. Therefore, this condition will change. And uh, uh, that's one way. Okay? The other way is changing B. And the way to change B could be the way to change the solvent. Right? Remember the B is proportional to eta over the solvent viscosity. So in one case, we had solvent of 1K. In another case, we had solvent of, uh, what was how many K? Of uh, 10K. So that changes, that's also changing the B by a factor of what, 10 or 20 times, okay? So let me give you the example that's in the book. For example, if we use 1K, okay? We, we, uh, If we use 1K and choose uh, this g gap is, norm, uh, is not small, but, but uh, uh, the B is large because you're choosing 1K, then you had in figure 623 that there's nothing but I should... Uh, I'm not sure what I can do to, if I can do this, that would be, that would kill it, right? So, let's go to figure 623. So you can see I'm going back and forth between the wall slip chapter and here because they are all related. The wall slip problem is foundationally important. And here we are. So here's the sample. Okay? Here's the sample. You can calculate, you will find that uh, uh, based on these Weisenberg numbers, uh, you have essentially nothing but slip. So again, I, I need you to be familiarized with, with this. The horizontal is the velocity, and vertical is the gap. So it's just like the way you see the movies. So if you look at the movie, you will find all the particles translate uniformly without being sheared because, because it's all slipping at the top and bottom surface. And uh, uh, And by the time that you go to the other system, so where you choose uh, this value now as the solvent, uh, you can really remove the wall slip and see the see the, the, the shear band that's here. See, when you use, when you use a, 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 a viscous solvent. So in any case, uh, there were a variety of uh, uh, 
conditions you can set up your system to do. And uh, next one, so since we're on this page, we can have a case where, sorry, where because the solvent you use has such a high viscosity, the B is so small that the, your, plot, your, your profile essentially is linear. And this is all just because the B is too small. And if you choose this, if you play, replace the solvent with a different one, the condition changes. For example, even replace it just by two, 9K, that's 9 kilograms per mole as the solvent, the shear binding is here. So you can do a variety of things to, uh, uh, to learn about the conditions for, uh, for shear binding. Any questions? So this is just a, a really, a, a if, a, if anything, what I should emphasize is the creep uh, did not uh, uh, prevent us from seeing, did not prevent the system from showing shear bending. So this is a, a subject we'll pick up later about what, what, why shear bending is so uh, difficult to avoid, actually. Any questions? Let me try to see if uh, there are anything else we need to do. Not I know of. Any questions? So one, one of the... Uh, um, well, I don't know by now uh, how much you, how much you uh, appreciated all this. Basically, what we're discussing so far is startup shear with a Weizenberg number sufficiently large. It turns out you need to be sufficiently large for the bulk to be sheared. This this condition is when bulk start to enter into non-linear uh, response. In other words, when bulk start to have uh, Weizenberg number larger than one. This is the condition, basically. So you need to shear a lot, and uh, uh, we know uh, stress-wise it has this overshoot. We know we have talked about this look like is a yield point. And the rest we have not said too much about why, it, why the stress drops. Um, and you may or may not see shear bending. And this may be transcend. This is the part I didn't even describe in detail. This shear bending could be transcend. And by the time you have steady state, by the time you have steady state, you may, you, your shear binding may even disappear. So this is all depend on how much uh, disentanglement there is. And of course, I start to speak about disentanglement. This is uh, the whole point of what is the molecular origin. Of, uh, of yielding. You know, what is the corresponding steps at the chain level? What happened? What happened when you can no longer shear elastically? Uh, the, if you, i just trying to help you again. The, the, really, the first time we speak about disentanglement is really from Mosley. And that's uh, enough, meaning that insight about what is wall slip uh, is what carry us through. We don't know better. We don't have to know more. Or if you, if you, 
if I may allow me to say that. Okay? Uh, we obviously didn't know there was shear banding. Uh, we had certain reasons to, to think about whether that's possible or not, but, but the notion of, of uh, disentanglement is not that uh, so unfamiliar to us. It's from here. It obviously uh, occurs prematurely. When I say that, I mean this obviously apparently occurs first at where the sample is in contact with the surface, not in the bulk. But since polymer is so, uh, can be so entangled, so viscous, and loss of entanglement can give you such a contra big contrast lower the, the this interfacial viscosity by a great deal, right? I know in the book, I, uh, I think I also use the notation of eta i. I could be wrong. Yeah, I use notation of eta i to refer to something interfacial. That this ratio can be very, very high. That's the point. And from there, we appreciate, even if just one, it's well defined there, too, because uh, we, we already have the system biased to fail at the surface. We know where the crack is, okay? We know where the failure is. It is at the surface. And the rest is all well understood in the sense our theoretical estimate even allows you to conf sort of confirms that indeed just one monolayer disentangled. How about that? I think uh, if you go to the details of uh, chapter six, it, it is, I'm pretty confident that, uh, you know, for example, stick slip transition or whatnot, that really it just involves one monolayer. And one monolayer, if you have a thousand monolayers, okay? Okay? Your SS curve, your SS, the stick slip transition will be a thousand times larger, which I don't observe. In other words, what I observe is indeed in agreement with the theoretical estimate of how much it would jump would occur involving one monolayer. So this deeply impresses us about what uh, uh, could be the consequence of uh, disentanglement. We learn from there, nothing could be different in the bulk if this happens in the bulk. Of course, it first happened at the surface because it, it, it biased, because the red chains are different than the black chains. They are tethered to a fixed surface. They are not mobile, okay? So you're really just pulling the red chains out You, gra you, you grab the chain out. When you don't have that condition, I want, uh, want to invite you to think about it. When you don't have that, then there is only the black chain trying to grab each other and see if it can tear it away from each other. So I, I try to recall how I mean, building here is the notion that if you want to think about entanglement as such, which is what I would think it is, not the two model necessarily, if this is what I think it is, then the disentanglement learning even from here is really a matter of losing grip, meaning they start to slide relative to each other. Well, at least that was the insight that uh, was convenient to borrow and to think that this could, or think is probably the wrong word. Uh, it, it is permissible that something could happen between 
a state where this is uh, uh, still intact. In other words, there is tension in there. Versus somehow you lost that uh, balance. Well, this is uh, still long from the point where we will discuss in, in more detail. But I just want you to, uh, to appreciate that how little we know from what slip is sufficient for us to, uh, to find that we are not uh, totally in a vacuum in terms of uh, dealing with the concept of what could happen to the bulk. And certainly, before the movies, we already, well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. It was, in fact, the movie that allowed us to uh, more deeply appreciate what this point is. Uh, uh, although, I have to say that, that the meaning of this maximum should have been possible to discuss before any movie, before any observations of shear band. Uh, I must say that, uh, well, if you like, uh, uh, Maxwell said that. He didn't have a movie. He said that in 79, that this is yield. Because this bloody curve, I, I use an English phrase, bloody. This bloody curve, SS curve, looks damn similar to what you see in solid mechanics when some material yields and it goes plastic deformation. So why not call it a yield? The corresponding molecular process, what it is, that's a separate point. That's, in fact, is the whole point. But, right? But the, I don't know if I can easily find my uh, punch line here, it's here. There are only two questions in nonlinear rheology of untangled polymers. One you can apply, one you can think that your deformation is still fine, that is, you don't lose entanglement, and when do you lose it? Any questions? We're done for today, because I, I really just want to close on this point. Um, perhaps with a, a, one more uh, thing I was planning to show, so let's do it here instead of uh, next time, which is uh, uh, was what I tried to say, that this required quite a bit of deformation, right? We even learned from lab that there is a scaling law that we went through in chapter seven. Uh, but largely, this number is typically not larger than 10. So it's anywhere from two to 10. That is, I say this for an interesting reason. So if that's the case, what about I do so-called large amplitude oscillatory shear. When we say it's a large amplitude, we mean this gamma zero is not small. When we say small amplitude, small amplitude oscillatory shear, we went through several times. For polymers, at least, we typically say this gamma is, let's say, less than 10%. It turns out it's less than 10% for a pure melt is going to give you a linear response, which is what small amplitude oscillatory shear is designed for. Large amplitude just really means gamma zero being larger than two, for example. And the idea was, gee, if I just shear back and forth, uh, height is h. I shear 2h to the left and 2h to the right, and some just back and forth, it might be enough to shake up the system. Well, 
shake up the system homogeneously or not? That's the question. Right? In other words, I can shake it up. Uh, yeah, that doesn't do it that way. I can shake it up. And so this is the last movie I want to show you. And I see uh, myself uh, uh, running to trying to convert what they're trying to do. Uh, I'm trying to stop this play mode. This computer continues to have a, a issue. Uh, basically, in any case, uh, just imagine, uh, in, in fact, there are a few things you could uh, speak about. Y you know, you know uh, when you do oscillatory shear, you also know, uh, of course, it's oscillatory. So you know the shear rate is just differentiating of that. So the shear rate. Uh, 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 the maximum shear rate is given by this. Okay? So you, of course you can have this condition being large, much larger than one, so on and so forth. But basically you can think about choosing a particular value of this and have the corresponding gamma y for that. And it turns out your gamma zero doesn't need to be even larger than gamma y. But over time, so over time, I think the only way I have to do it is to kill that uh, ten again. It's really annoying. Okay. So let me do it big enough. So this is the movie for large amplitude oscillatory shear. So it's going to oscillate back and forth. Oops, you see the bottom is already going crazy. Please look at the screen instead. I mean, look at that. Flip? Oh, no. Look at that. Look, now the middle broke. Do you see that? At the middle, it's breaking. See that? Around, around here. Look at that. And there may be a little bit of slip here. Who cares? We understand slip. We understand the condition we apply is, is not something slip can save us from undergoing into the high shear in the bulk. OK. I close out on this note. Uh, we'll pick up from, from here next time.